Thanks, Luke. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Az. I'm senior software engineer at Microsoft, and I'm co-organizer of Girls Geek Sydney and She Hacks. And you can see my dog, Cookie. He's an in he's an English staffy, and he's Instagram influencer. He works with RSPCA and a few other rescues to help some unfortunate <coughs> animals. Today I'm super excited to be here and talk about Azure Databricks Operator. And I'd like to share with you why we built it and what exactly it is and how you can use it. I work for the organization called Commercial Software Engineering, or for short CSE. CSE is a global uh, organization and it sits outside of the product group. What we do, we are responsible to work with Microsoft clients and Help, with the, uh, help them to solve their technical problems. And as part of our engagement, we share the outcome of our engagement and we share the source code or tools or services that we built after we finish the engagement. Our engagement is around eight weeks and we are free resources. In one of our engagement, we came across a team that they had a pipeline similar to what you see here. So they had few applications that they were ingesting a data, they were saving the data, and they were using Azure Databricks for the ETL process for the transforming uh, the data, and then they were using Azure SQL Data Warehouse for one source of the truth to get insights from the data that they have, and they were using Power BI for the reporting. For those who are not familiar with Azure Databricks, Azure Databricks is used for large-scale data processing, and it's an Apache Spark-based analytics platform, and it's created at its, and it's built by creator of Apache Spark. It's optimized for Azure, and it's a platform as a service offering. It's, it can spin a, a Spark cluster in a few minutes. Because it's backed by Apache Spark, all the operations are, are processed or performed on in-memory objects, and it's really quick and it's fast. It's integrated with Azure Active Directory, and it provides the interactive workspace that data scientists and data engineers, they can work on the same data and they can collaborate. It provides the version history. It supports SQL, R, Python, and Scala, and also you can bring machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. So the requirement that the ops team had is because they wanted to make sure that the, uh, the transform jobs that are running on Azure Databricks, they can monitor it and they can maintain it. So they wanted to see the list of jobs that they are running on a, uh, on a Databricks. They want to stop the job if it's required. They want to rerun the job. And basically, uh, they wanted to make sure that they can do the, the everyday jobs easily. There are a few options to achieve this. One is uh, going to Azure Portal or Databricks Dashboard. If you know the jobs, the name of the jobs or the ID of the jobs, you can go and look it up, and then you can see that what's the status of each one. Or potentially, you can use Azure Databricks API directly, so you can get the bearer token, and then you can use Postman, or you can write your own application to curl uh, or, to, or to get uh, the status of each job. There is a Databricks CLI that you can install, and you can get the exact, and Databricks CLI, uh, it uses Databricks API behind the scene, but it has its own dependencies. You have to install Python, so it, it has its own uh, trouble for installing it and getting the status of each job. And then they were thinking, is there any other option? Or can we centralize everything that we do? Because everything that we have, it's on Kubernetes. We manage all of the application that's running on Kubernetes. Can we centralize or can we get um, the status of the jobs with kubectl? And after, and then we decided, okay, what if we create, we extend the Kubernetes API and we create a kind, kind not notebook job and we provide the information that we need that Databricks can run it. So for example, where the notebook is, uh, do we need to provide a um, timeout, what, what's the cluster, so how many uh, worker nodes we want, and what information from the Kubernetes secrets we want to pass to uh, 
to the Databricks notebook. So for example, the connection strings, all the information that you save it in as a Kubernetes secrets. And thanks for Nick to explain most of the stuff that I'm going to quickly just give a quick background. Basically, the, a resource in Kubernetes is the API that it saves the data. And it saves the structured data for you. So there are two different ways of create your custom resource. Or one is defining CRD, and another one is API aggregation. Each of them has its pros and cons. When you define CRD, it's very simple, and you can use it uh, easily. With API aggregation, it provides more flexibility around the versioning, so the version of the data that you want to save uh, and the conversion between the versions and how you want to save the data. So that's the difference in each pros and cons that you can pick based on your requirement. Custom resource by itself, it saves the Kubernetes object uh, for you. So it saves it in, in uh, but it doesn't do any operation behind it. So it just saves it. So you can say, save this structured data and give me back that structured data. But you want to do some code around it. You want to say that, OK, this is my expected behavior. This is my desired state. And just make sure that this desired, desired state is happening. So you want to say, uh, you want to write some code to get the desired uh, desired states, compare it with current state, and make it in sync. And it's the definition of the declarative API, and it's possible with a custom controller. After discussing with our expert at Microsoft, and Paul is sitting at, uh, at the back, so we were, uh, we were saying, OK, how we can achieve it quickly? Because we had only eight weeks, and we wanted to make sure that we can do what we need in a short amount of time. And we decided to use KubeBuilder, and we decided to use Databricks REST API, and combining these two to build our operator. We went through a few iterations. So the first iteration that we went was we created a controller that our pod has two containers, because Databricks had out of the box the Python SDK that you could easily interact with the Python SDK. So what we did, we built two applications one was Python that it was working with Databricks, sending the, uh, sending the notebook job information and getting the information back. And then we had our Databricks operator. And then uh, these two were, because they were in the same pod, they could easily connect each other. So they were very tightly coupled. In the second iteration, after we said, uh, OK, everything goes well, you know, the ops teams are happy, that's what we want to go and we move further. We spent some time, invest money, and we uh, created our own Go SDK for Databricks. And that's why we, have, uh, we had only one application. And it, it saves us a lot of, uh, so it makes it a uh, whole process easier because we had, um, previously we had two different CI/CD pipeline. We had to manage two different images. So, and then you, got, uh, you had to context switch between two different languages. Now everything is in Go and it's very nice and clear. And in iteration three, which we released it this week, basically. We, we expanded uh, more, more kinds, more types, and uh, it works uh, with Databricks, and it's kind of like a one-to-one -one mapping with all of the objects that Databricks has. To run the Azure Databricks operator, you need the Kubernetes cluster and Azure, uh, Azure Databricks. And our operator works on local clusters. You can use kind, or you can use any uh, clusters. I opt in to use uh, uh, in the demo, I'm going to show uh, to use uh, AKS. So for those who are not familiar with Azure portals, so when you go to Azure portals and create Kuber search for the Kubernetes service, you search for it and then hit create, and it has a nice GUI that you can fill the form and then hit create and review, and it automatically spins off the cluster for you. If you are more type of the command line person, these are uh, three lines of code that you need to run. So you create your Service, pr ser service principle, you create your uh, resource group, and then you create your cluster while providing this three information. For creating Azure Databricks, again, you search for Azure Databricks, simple, and then you fill, uh, you fill the form, you, 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 you provide the name of the workspace, and the resource group and location, and the pricing tier, and then you hit create, and after that, you get your working space. To work uh, the, with the Azure Databricks API, you need a token. 
And to get the token, you need to go to the user setting and generate token. Uh, you can make, you can remove the value of the lifetime from 90 to zero, so that your token never expires. So it's up to you that what you, what's your policy. And then to install the, the operator, you click, you go to the GitHub and then click on the release and then get the release. And then basically in a release, you get a nice YAML file. And I realize that it's too small to read it, but basically if you browse through the YAML file, you will see it has a namespace, it creates a new namespace, it creates the custom resource definition, and then there is a deployment in it, and in a deployment, as you can see, it's in a namespace, the same namespace, and then you need to provide two, two Kubernetes secrets. Um, one is your Databricks host, and one is your Databricks token. And to install it, basically you create a namespace, you set your secrets, and then you said kubectl apply the setup.yaml, and then you have your operator up and running. And then if you run get, uh, kubectl get CRD, you get the uh, R notebook jobs there, and then if you wanna see all of the resources under the namespace, you can see that there is a pods and deployment, and you can see the logs there. Okay, I don't know what the demo got is up to today, but let's see that if I can get All right, so for those who are not familiar with Databricks, so when you go to the Databricks, you can launch your workspace, and here I have my notebooks running here, so one of them is called Twitter. And then imagine that the data scientists and data engineers are working together, they, they grab the secrets, for example, I'm going to extract the data from Twitter, in a sort of, but in your, in any case scenario, it can be reading it from the data lake or it can be reading it from the stream, so it doesn't matter. And then uh, I'm importing one Python library and then I'm showing the tweets. So basically I provide the filters that I, I want to extract and then it's, uh, it's showing up the tweets that extract. Uh, uh, the text of the tweets. You can, the, the data scientists, they can potentially run the sentiment analytics on it, get the sentiments and save the data somewhere else. But this is for the demo. Imagine that now you wanna run it in uh, with the operator. So you need to do some modifications. So if I go to workspace and then I say, okay, I've done my experiment and now I'm ready to run this job as part of my ETL. So instead of providing the, the secret screw from the uh, hard-coded secret, you want to provide the secrets that you pass it from uh, the YAML file, and then the, the you want to uh, get the filter from the YAML file as well, and that's it. So you want to use this, inf uh, this notebook in your ETL process. If I go back to my YAML file, and can, I can provide the name of the job that I want to run in, uh, I can provide the path of my notebook and the filters, so I can provide any filter that I want, and the, the mapping between my secret that I have it on my Kubernetes and the secrets that I want to have it in my Databricks, and the uh, additional libraries that I want to pull into my notebook. It can be a Scala, it can be Java, or it can be Python, so you need to provide the type of the library and then you provide your cluster spec. So what's the version of VM that you want, how many workers that you want. So after you set it up, you can say kubectl apply Yeah, so it creates a job. So if I say kubectl get notebook job, it should list all of the uh, all of the jobs that are running in my uh, Databricks. So if I say kubectl describe notebook job and then provide the name name of the job. So 
So it shows that where, where is it at, what's the job ID, and what, what's the life uh, or status of the job. So if I now go to my clusters, so you can see that this job is spinning. So if I click on that, and if I go to the job run, so you can see the parameters that I pass, the dependency, and all of the information. So when it's, it starts running, you can see that the, the actual process is running. So you can easily go back to the clusters. And let's just stop. So let's say, Let's delete the job. So when I go back here, and the state should change this from pending to terminate. Oops. Ooh. Yeah, see, did you see that? Uh, I was too quick. Yeah, so you can see that it's terminated. And then if you say kubectl get all, and then you provide a name. Uh, thank you. So you should provide all of the resources that it's under the, na uh, the namespace. It's a fairly new project, and we like to get everyone involved. It's born in Australia, and we want to make sure that you know we can do it in Australia. We can be the operators that you know everyone can use it and make benefit from it. And it has all of the cool technologies behind it. We use Azure DevOps for our pipelines and for release management, and it's a very cool project. And then if you are interested to know about the operators, these are the resources. And we'd love to have your pull requests, you know, um, you know, be involved in the, in the building operators. And thank you so much.